Good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me on this event one more time. Uh, we live in a very difficult world in that what we thought was perfectly reasonable, perfectly sustainable things are no longer considered sustainable. I mean, all these, uh, as I was just mentioned, the rela re economic relationship between China and United States are moving further and further apart. And the war in Ukraine is still continuing with seems seemingly no end in sight. And <clears throat> last year, I made the same prediction, unfortunately, that war in Ukraine will continue even with uh, very poor performance on the part of the Russian army. And that was because, as I was already introduced, Putin managed to increase per capita GDP of Russians by 12 times in 14 years. 12 times in 14 years. You know, if anyone had this kind of economic achievement, he's a national hero. And so even though there was a little bit of decline here once uh, he invaded uh, Crimea, for most Russians, Putin is still a national hero. And so a little bit of military uh, setbacks here and there is not going to kick him out of the uh, presidency that easily. And so even if Russian army is not doing very well in Ukraine, my guess is that he will stay on until something really horrible happens. And <clears throat> with this kind of economic achievement, it's very difficult for outside, even Mr. Prikogin, who tried to do this military uh, protest against Putin probably realized that even though he may be able to take over parts of uh, Russia, he does not have the performance record like this one. Unfortunately, when the news reports, CNN, BBC, talk about Ukraine, Russia, they only talk about the politics or the military issues, never economics. But it's economic performance that is keeping Putin in place. So we have to really pay more attention to what's happening to the economy, what's happening to per capita GDP of Russia. Unfortunately, both Russia and Ukraine stopped publishing the new GDP numbers for obvious reasons. So this chart is exactly the same chart as you saw last year. I apologize for that, but I think it's important to remind ourselves that this is where Putin's support comes from. That's the Russia. In the Western countries, as I indicated to you last year, they were so determined to make sure that Putin will not win. Not saying he has to lose, but he cannot win. And that's, that comes from the Western consensus that dictator should never be appeased. If you give them something at the beginning, then they want more and more and more. And that's basically what happened in 1938 between Adolf Hitler in Germany and Neville Chamberlain of the UK. At that time, Germany was having a great economy, just like Putin, and he wanted to get back all the territories that Germany lost after World War I, and he was actually uh, taking some of the back. The Western d democracies wanted to stop him, and then this little piece of real estate uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, there were some Germans living on the other side of the border still, and the, uh, Hitler wanted this back. And Neville Chamberlain said to Hitler, if this is the last piece of real estate, maybe we can have a deal. And Hitler said, yes, this is the last piece of real estate I will ever want. So Neville Chamberlain said, okay, let's have a deal. Well, one year later, or less than one year later, Hitler attacked Poland and the World War II started. And it was such a huge shock. And that issue has been reminded uh, in all schools in Western countries. So I went through San Francisco public school system. Whether you were studying in junior high or in high school or college, that event in 1938 is always reminded uh, uh, to make sure that people understand we never appease a dictator. 
And so West has no reason to uh, step back. And the Ukrainians apparently, after 18 months, are still willing to fight. So you put the three together, the Russians, the West, and the Ukrainians, there's still no reason for war to end. And so this thing is going to be with us for quite a while until something happens in Ukraine, uh, something happens in Russia, because the other parts are not likely to change. <coughs> and <coughs> Russian economy is only 7% of US economy, only 10% of the Eurozone economy. It's about the size of South Korea. And so if the war continues, the Russian economy will be weaker, weaker, their military uh, strength will be depleted, and that's basically what the West wants, in that at the end of the day, whatever the treaty might be, uh, peace treaty might be, Russia will be so weakened that it will not be able to do anything like this again to Estonia or uh, Moldova, Finland, and so forth, and that's basically the Western goal. But what is even more important and that was already mentioned at the beginning, is that this Russian invasion of Ukraine has completely changed the Western thinking about the priorities. Before that, for the last 30 years, the Western priority was always on economic welfare because the ideological battle between the communists and uh, democracies were already over, or so they thought, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. So the Western thinking was that now that we know what the final result was, that is that you have to have market economy and democracy to be really a winner. Even those countries that are still practicing communism, authoritarianism, will eventually come toward this final goal. And therefore, we shouldn't really worry about ideology, we just talk about economic welfare. And that was the world for the last 30 years, before Russian invasion of Ukraine. But once the Russia invaded Ukraine, all those people in the West realized that just because the country has become richer doesn't mean they're going to be free and open. And of course, that's happening across the Taiwan Strait also. So all these things are changing. Uh, now, what's most important is national security, fighting for uh, defending freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law. Economic welfare is now back to the, to the back seat. And you can see that in so many areas these days. For example, German decision to stop rely, reliance on the Russian energy. When you think about it, Germans were dependent on Russian energy for 40% of the energy needs are met by the Russian supplies. For Germany to say we're not going to be dependent on Russian energy means huge cost increase for German households, German businesses, their competitiveness will be uh, reduced, but they said, let's do it. We're not going to be dependent on those guys any longer. And was it about eight months ago? German Air Force actually sent a whole bunch of fighter planes together with their support planes all the way to this part of the world, first to Singapore, then went to Japan, then went to South Korea, then went to, uh, I think, Australia, to do military exercise with air forces in this part of the world. Something like that. Who could have predicted 18 months ago that the German Air Force would actually bring all the fighter planes to do exercise in Asia? Germany, after World War II, just like Japan, became such a pacifist country because the war was so bad for them. So, they, so once the uh, Cold War ended, Germans really decided to have, uh, uh, have good friends with everybody. So even though Germany had tanks, Germany had fighter planes, many of those were completely uh, unmaintained. So Germany is making lots of tanks, but many of the tanks in the German army are not maintained enough to run. And that was true with the Air Force too. That Germany is sending fighter planes to this part of the world. Why? Because of Taiwan. That's the kind of change that's happening around the world. This is now such an important place among the scheme of things in geopol uh, geopolitics that even Germans are willing to send fighter planes. I'm sure they wanted to do practice with the Taiwanese Air Force, but that was perhaps too, too strong of a message, so they did practice with everybody else around Taiwan.
How many people could have predicted such a big change in German behavior, even to the point of sending fighter planes to Asia? And finally, of course, Swiss and Austria, two supposedly neutral countries, Swiss for hundreds of years, Austria since 1945, both joined sanctions against Russia. So they're no longer neutral. But these massive changes are happening in the Western world, and that has a huge implications on uh, those of us here as well. For example, in the past, for, if, until 18 months ago, if this Taiwanese companies had a business with the Chinese companies, and these Chinese companies had a business with a Russian company, no one cared. This was perfectly okay. And a lot of business were going on around like this all over. But now, if someone finds out that this Taiwanese companies or Japanese companies having business with these Chinese companies are, pro are providing something that might have military implications that might help the Chinese or the Russian army, then people will go after these companies and say, what do you, what do you think you're doing? The CIA may be knocking on the door. And suddenly when something like that happens, the investment that we made on that company, the loan you made to that company, or the shares you bought of the company, could suddenly uh, drop in value because now the authorities is trying to stop these companies from doing business with uh, its partners or whatever in China or elsewhere. So we have to be a lot more uh, alert about these geopolitical risks compared to just 18 months ago. Something that's completely unthinkable 18 months ago are now possible now. And so that's the first point that I want to make on uh, geo geopolitics. Then let's go get back to the economics. Uh, you know, we have this inflation problem and the Federal Reserve have been raising interest rates and that has been rocking the markets all around the world. We have some banking crisis even in the United States and, and even in Switzerland as well. The first, the initial trigger of this uh, inflation was this supply side problems. And how did the supply side problems come? Well, this shows the uh, inventory to sales ratios in the United States. And during the pandemic, you, you never know when cu customers will come back to your store, so they allow the inventory to fall quite substantially. And then the economy begins to, began the recovery, and suddenly all these guys said, oh, we have to uh, rebuild our inventories. Well, if one or two companies are rebuilding inventories, that's not a big problem. But when everybody tries to rebuild the inventories at the same time, how do you rebuild inventories? Well, if this is the demand, you have to order more than the demand to, have, to build up your inventories. But when everybody does this all at the same time, then everybody ran into shortages. And that's basically how this uh, inflation started, all from the supply side. But I'm happy to say that that part of the problem is beginning to work itself out. And some American retailers are even saying they have too much inventory now. And so we are making progress, but we are not at the end of the process yet. So in my view, I think we have four key factors that brought us inflation. One is the demand problem. That's the one that I just described to you, that everybody's ordering at the same time to increase their inventories, to try to meet the pent-up demand. And everybody does it all at the same time. Of course, uh, there will be tremendous uh, excess demand. And the other one is energy. And to a lot of us in this part of the world, this is energy that is uh, adding to our inflation. The energy one is very tricky. And as I mentioned this last year as well, in that until 2021, the world was, was the same in a sense that the demand for fossil fuel was always there always increasing. So those energy suppliers trying to uh, find new uh, oil fields, new gas fields, there's always a very big risk. But at the end of the day, there was always demand. So even though there were uh, price fluctuations, the fact that demand is always there was a huge sense of relief for those people making investments. Now, that world doesn't exist anymore. Because now there's a rule that says you cannot sell diesel cars, you cannot sell gasoline cars after 2030 or 2035. And China has that law already. Europe has that rule already. 
And at some point, the U.S. will have it, Japan maybe here as well, that you cannot sell uh, cars running on diesel fuel or gasoline. And it's not going to stop with cars. It's going to go to trucks, it's going to go to buses, it goes to so many other places, air conditioning, everything, office building, all of that. So now, for energy producers, you know that the demand for fossil fuel will be falling after, say, 2035. That gives you only 12 years to recover all your cost and make handsome profit. In the next year, it will be much less. <clears throat> if it's 12 years, next year it will be 11 years. The following year will be only 10 years to recover all your cost and make profit. So my guess is that energy market is going through a very different uh, reorganization, as it were. And you can see that in the behavior of, for example, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia used to be very close to the United States in so many areas because Saudi's interest in keeping the energy prices stable was very much in the interest of the Americans as well. But you might have noticed that not last year or so that Saudi is doing something quite different and sometimes siding with the Russians, OPEC, and others to keep the prices up as high as possible. Because if you're Saudi and you know that you're not going to have much in revenue from oil after 2035, you better get all the revenue you can get between now and 2035. So their priorities have changed. Their diplomatic prior, uh, relations are also, also changing because this is a new world for them. We cannot blame them for that. If I were, if we were in the Saudi Arabia, we would be probably thinking the same way too. So energy is one of the pr things that I think prices will remain relatively high going forward. There, might be, there will be volatilities because this is a rather speculative market as well, but my sense is that it will remain relatively high for, for uh, quite some time, until 2035. On the supply side, of course, the COVID-19 disrupted a lot of things, and that was a very serious issue on the supply side. But that problem seems to be coming to an end although it looks like there's another COVID version that's coming around and we all have to be careful all over again. But compared to like two years ago, this COVID-driven supply disruptions seems to be more or less under control. But then we run into another one, which is on this side here. I would argue that there was a labor market reset in so many countries around the world because of COVID-19. What do I mean by the labor market reset? When COVID-19 hit, more than 20 million Americans lost their jobs literally overnight. Unemployment rate went to, all the way to 15%, the worst in 90 years. When one or two people are losing jobs, and then those job people might stay around the same city, similar industry, so that they can get back to the uh, in initial job when the company gets in a better shape. But when 20 million people lose their jobs all at the same time, you cannot afford to stay and wait because everybody's looking for jobs. So what happened is that so many people start moving to other industries, other geographical locations, wherever they can find their jobs, because otherwise you have no jobs, no food on the table. That means all the expertise, the skills, know-how that these 20 million people had were decreasing every day because these people are looking for jobs in other industries, in other locations. What that meant was that effectively, labor supply curve was shifting to the left because their skills levels are falling. And then so that when the economy recovered and they wanted these people back, you, because the labor supply curve has shifted to the left, you have to pay a lot more to get the same workers with same skills. And that's how you ended up having these wages rising and employee, employers scrambling to get the workers because it became so hard to get the same level of workers again. And you can see this in this chart here. Those countries where unemployment rate went sharply higher, so United States, Canada, the wage levels are also going much, much higher. And those countries where unemployment rate did not move up much, whether in here, Japan, or here in Italy, the unemployment, I mean, uh, Italy, unemployment rate was high to begin with, 
but it did not shut up like in the United States or Canada. Then labor uh, wage increases have been very stable. Because in the case of Japan, for example, most of the workers were still uh, working. Japanese unemployment rate never went higher than 3.4%. So most people still with the firm, so their skill levels were still there, nothing was lost. So when the demand came back, they could go back and start producing those things because all the skills was, skill sets are still there. But in the case of other countries like US and Canada, they have to get the workers from uh, other industries or other areas. They don't have all the skills needed, and that's why the prices went up uh, so much higher. So I would argue that this problem, the labor market reset, especially for countries like United States, UK, and Canada, will be with us for a while. Because once you lose your skill levels, it's going to take a while to regain it. So we might see this uh, labor market issues for another one or two years, perhaps even longer, because we have no, no historical example to see how long this process is going to last. But my guess is that at least a year or two, we're going to be facing with this uh, labor market problems because of this, what I call, labor market reset. So those are the factors that brought us inflation. But what about the factors that brought us deflation? Are they all gone? Because depending on how you think about the factors that brought us deflation, you know, our view of the future will be very different. If the factors that brought us deflation are all gone, then we have to really think about the wage price spiral like we saw in the 1960s and 70s. But if those factors are still there, then once everything is normalized, then we should go back to that world that we were there uh, before COVID, COVID-19. And I would argue that those factors that brought us deflation are still with us. And the only thing is that the other factors are on top of it, which is pushing the prices higher. But if they are gone, we might come back to the same world that we were before COVID-19. So what were the, those three factors that brought us uh, deflation? I think there are three. One of them is what I call balance sheet recession. And I'm, I'm sure those who listen to me are sick of this thing already. Uh, balance sheet recession happens when everybody's in the, uh, in the bubble with borrowed money. And when the bubble bursts, asset prices collapse, liabilities remain, balance sheets underwater, these people all have to repair their balance sheets. They're technically bankrupt. How do you repair your balance sheets? You pay down debt. So people start paying down debt. That's the right thing to do at the individual level individual companies, individual households, that's the right thing to do, to repair your balance sheets. But when everybody does it all at the same time, we get into a big problem in that in the national economy, if someone is saving money or paying down debt, you need someone else on the other side borrowing and spending money. In a usual world, it's people like us, you and I in the financial sector, plus the central bank, taking the money from the savers, giving to someone who, uh, who can use it. If there are too many borrowers and the economy is overheating, central bank raises interest rates. If too few borrowers, economies are slowing, central bank will bring rates down. That's how you keep the economy going. But in the balance sheet recession, everybody's paying down debt. No one's borrowing money, even at zero interest rates. And that's how we get into this uh, huge deflationary uh, spiral. When you get into that situation where no one's borrowing money because the private sector cannot change their behavior because they are doing the right thing, you need the government to come in and borrow and spend. So government has to be the borrower of last resort. But this whole concept of balance sheet recession did not exist when, uh, when these bubbles burst. So most government officials said, no, government should not borrow money, should not borrow money. So they did not borrow enough money, and as a result, we had deflation. And then the government then told the central bank, we cannot borrow money, we have too much debt. So central bank bring interest rates down. So all the central banks brought interest rates down. But there was another thing that we were not taught in our economics, and that is that you have to have borrowers before monetary policy can work. But when borrowers disappear or repairing balance sheets, you bring rates down to zero, nothing happens. And of course, nothing happened in the United States after 2008, Japan after 1990, because borrowers were not there. They're all paying down debt. That's how we get into the, this, this inflation, uh, deflation situation. 
And you are not a, and this part is becoming better and better because if you continue to pay down debt, at some point your balance sheet is balanced again. And then you can say, I'm out of this mess. Now I'm going to start making money. Not that simple, unfortunately, because those people who had to repair their balance sheet, I hope none of you had this horrible experience, but if you do have this experience, you know it's a very, very painful process to repair your balance sheets. And after that, you say to yourself, I will never want to borrow money again. This is a kind of a psychological trauma. And Americans who lived through the Great Depression, which was the biggest balance sheet recession in history, those Americans never borrow money until they died because the experience was so bad. And we are having that in many parts of the world as well. Many Japanese corporate executives still are traumatized by that experience. So even though balance sheets are becoming cleaner every day, the trauma, unfortunately, is still there. The other factor that we have to worry about is that, as I already mentioned, it's much cheaper and much more profitable to build things outside the developed world. So Taiwanese companies would rather uh, expand factories in India or Bangladesh or Vietnam instead of expanding more here. Uh, same thing for the Japanese. Uh, Americans will find Mexico is much better than expanding factories in Pennsylvania or New York. And the Europeans are finding the same with Eastern Europe because wages in Eastern Europe are much cheaper. When that is happening, the companies are still maximizing profits. They are not repairing balance sheets. But if you look at their domestic operation, they are not borrowing money because the money they need is the Vietnam currency. The money they need is the Bangladesh or Indian currency, not Taiwanese dollar or Japanese yen. But the household sector in all of these economies are still saving money. But the corporate sector that used to borrow money are no longer borrowing at home. They're borrowing abroad. Then you still get into this very similar situation to balance sheet recession. And I think that's what we ended up for all these years. And on the supply side, the fact that all these other countries, Bangladesh, India, are trying to attract factories from abroad uh, by setting up new industrial parks, more infrastructure, so that uh, companies can start their business production very quickly. As long as those uh, opportunities are there, globalization will continue. Cheaper products made abroad will come into Taiwan, will come into Japan, and then that adds to the infl this inflation as well. All of these factors, I'm afraid, are still with us. And if I may skip this chart and go to that one, this shows what's been happening to money supply and the credit in each of these countries. So this one is the case of the United States. The red line is how much liquidity Federal Reserve pumped into the economy. The next one is money supply, how much money people have in a bank. And finally, this green line is how much money banks lent out. And if you remember your economics, we were all taught that these three lines are supposed to move together, right? So some central bank increases monetary base by 10%, money supply, credit also increasing by 10%. And that world did exist until 2008, three lines moving together. But once we hit the bubble, once the bubble burst in the United States, Chairman Bernanke at the time increased monetary base uh, QE1, quantitative easing 2, QE3, 400%. But look what happens to the uh, credit here, the green line. It actually goes down because people are paying down debt. So the amount of uh, loan out there was actually shrinking for the first three years and then gradually increased thereafter. Of the three lines, I pay most attention to this green line. Why? Because central bank can add all the reserves into the banking system at once. But for the money to come out of the banking system and into the real economy, banks have to lend money. It cannot give away money because this money actually belongs to depositors. And this is how much money uh, banks lend out. So even though central bank put in this much liquidity in the system, only this much actually came out. And, that's, and if this is about 3% per year, that's not enough to produce inflation, which is why inflation rates remain so low for so long. Now, that's the world that existed all the way until COVID-19. But starting 2021, something happened. 
And suddenly, Americans start borrowing money here. So if I may just, uh, oh yeah. I just magnified that part of the chart here. When COVID-19 hit, there was a big increase in borrowings because all these companies thought they have to have some cash in the bank so that they can pay whatever they have to pay, even though the income might be drying up. But then they realized that, oh, it's not so bad. So they pay back the debt to the bank. But starting around 2021, they stopped borrowing money like crazy. Increase of about 11% per year compared to 3% per year before that. Now, I don't know what is the reason behind this. And I'm trying to ask a lot of people to find out why there's a sudden pickup in these borrowings. But you know, this is already after 10 years of the Lehman crisis, so their balance sheets must be cleaner. Inflation rate was high, interest rates are low, so real interest rates are very low. So those are probably the factors that was behind this uh, increase in lending. But from the perspective of the Federal Reserve, the fact that bank borrowing is skyrocketing means you could really have a classic inflation, right? Because the money is coming out of the banking system, entering the real world very rapidly. That means there might be too much money chasing too few goods. That's a classic inflation. And I think this is one of the key reasons why the Federal Reserve suddenly, November 2021, started arguing that we're going to be inflation fighter, not a deflation fighter. Whereas before that, Jay Powell was still saying, I'm the deflation fighter, not an inflation fighter. The sudden change, I think, has a lot to do with this one. And they kept on raising interest rates, interest rates, interest rates. And finally, this is uh, beginning to slow down, which is a good news as far as the inflation rate is concerned. But I will get back to this a little later because this is only happening in the United States. In other parts of the world, this is Europe. No such pickup in borrowings here. Still very steady, slow. Uh, this is the UK, still very slow, actually coming down a little bit. And this is Japan, no sharp pickup in uh, bank lending. And finally, just for the contrast, this is Taiwan. In Taiwan, three lines are more or less moving together. So Taiwan is still in the textbook world. Taiwan is not experiencing balance sheet recession, which is a good thing. This is the, we are in a normal world here. We can still use our textbooks to see you know, what might happen next because these lines are more or less moving together. Uh, so if you compare all these uh, together, this is the Taiwan line, this is the American line, and the other three are the Eurozone, UK, and Japan. Although Taiwan line is moving rapidly higher, but there's no pickup. Right? The key point is whether there's acceleration. Only U.S. have this huge acceleration here, which then prompted the Federal Reserve to tighten monetary policy. The other three of uh, U.K. and Eurozone are tightening monetary policies, but not to the extent of the United States, because you, the differences are quite, quite clear. Then we run into another problem. And the problem is that this is the first time in history where central bank has to tighten monetary policy with all these excess reserves already in the system. In the past, excess reserves in the banking system was very small. So uh, the amount of reserves in the banking system was not an issue. But this time, because of all the quantitative easing, the amount of excess reserves in the US banking system is $3 trillion. That's 1,600 uh, percent higher, uh, 1,600 times than the amount of excess reserves that was in the system just before Lehman collapsed. So with so much excess reserves, how do you tighten monetary policy? And this is important because in the past, in the textbook world, without quantitative easing, central bank had two tools to tighten monetary policy. One is to squ uh, squeeze the availability of reserves, and the other is to raise interest rates. And when Paul Volcker, apparently Jay Powell's hero, uh, when he was tightening monetary policy back in 1979, he basically squeezed the availability of reserves. And because there was so little excess reserves in the banking system, 
when that reserve was squeezed, all these banks had to scramble for the reserves. Short-term interest rate went to 22%, and that killed the economy and the inflation very quickly, as in the textbook one. But this time, that option is not available. The $3 trillion of excess reserves, even if the J. Powell removed $1 trillion, there will be still $2 trillion left. And what does that mean? If someone comes in to borrow, to, uh, to borrow from the bank, and if, let's say the interest rate is 5%. In the past, if the, someone says, I'm willing to pay 6%, can we borrow the money? But if the bank did not have excess reserves, this bank will have to get more money from the depositors, go to the bond market, or go to the whatever market to get some money to lend, which is a very complicated process, which is why it was difficult for these people to borrow, even if they are willing to uh, pay more. This time, if the interest rate is 5% and someone comes in, I'm willing to pay 6, banks have $3 trillion to lend. So, oh, of course, sure. So as long as people are willing to pay a little higher than the official rate, the money can keep, keep on going uh, into, the, uh, into the economy because banks are stuck with so much excess reserves. As a result, even though Federal Reserve already raised rates to 5.25%, the market is really not all that tight. Uh, I mean, financial market is not all that uh, tight. And you can see that from this chart. This blue line is uh, financial condition index put together by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And the other one is the Federal Reserve's policy rate. And in the past, every time the policy rate goes up, the red line goes up, the blue line also went up. So every time the Fed tightened, monetary uh, financial condition also tightened. But recently, that relationship has broken down. The Fed has tightened this time you know, quite substantially from almost zero to 5.25, but the financial condition index is still minus 0 0.3, minus. Minus means it's still looser than the average of the last 50 years. It has to be in a positive range before it really starts squeezing the inflation. But the fact that we're still in a negative range means that it's not really tight enough to squeeze the inflation. That's why Jay Powell keeps on talking about uh, financial condition is not tight enough. Financial condition is not tight enough because he's referring to this thing. And it is not tight enough to really kill the inflation. So we are in a very different world. This is the first time in history where central bank has to tighten monetary policy with this humongous amount of excess reserves already in the system. And they, all the uh, tightening has to be on interest rates because they cannot use the other tool of uh, squeezing availability of reserves. And you can actually see this in m m many of the Federal Reserve publications. This is a uh, quote taken from uh, Beige book of the Federal Reserve, and you can see that, for example, San Francisco Fed, as late as October of 2022, by then the Fed was tightening quite uh, substantially. Competition for loans remained brisk. Liquidity was elevated. All these banks are trying to compete with the other banks to make sure that they can lend. And liquidity is elevated. Of course, there's $3 trillion of this stuff out there. So how do you tighten monetary policy in a situation like this? No one knows because there's no example to follow. Well, at least part of this was working, and that's the long end of the market. Long end of the market, 10-year uh, U.S. Treasuries, 30-year mortgages did go, back, uh, go up substantially, and that is resulting in some responses in the real estate market. For example, commercial real estate in the United States has fallen and some of the house prices are beginning to fall as well. So those are, th that part of the monetary tightening is working. But I will say only that part of the monetary tightening is really working. The short end of the market, I'm afraid, is not working. But in order to kill the inflation, they might have to tighten interest rates. They might have to raise interest rates further. And if they do, and if these commercial real estate prices, for example, start falling, sharply, then we're going to end up in another balance sheet recession all over again. So it's a very delicate act from this point onward. And this is not just an American problem. This is what's happening to European house prices. And they are also going pretty high. Uh, 
And some of them are beginning to come down in Netherlands and Germany. But if, it's, it's good that some of the prices are coming down because the price is already too high. But if it goes down substantially lower, then suddenly we'll be back to balance sheet recession all over again. So that's where the central bank has to navigate very, very uh, carefully. And the banking problems we are seeing, starting with the uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic, all are coming from this source, same reason. They never thought Fed would have to raise interest rates this much. Uh, if it's just 2 or 3% you in know, the holding of long-term bonds or commercial real estate mortgages, the price might go down, but it was completely within, you know, uh, they can handle it. But now they realize that in, Fed is raising interest rates to 5%, may, may even go to close to 6 Then all these long-term fixed rate uh, mortgages, assets that these banks are holding, the prices are going down very sharply, and that's affecting the uh, health of the banking system. But my guess is that uh, Chairman Powell will have to do two things. They have to tighten monetary policy, raise interest rates, but without causing the banking crisis. So that's going to be a very delicate act from this point onwards. And, uh, Chairman Powell is also reducing the excess reserves in the banking system, so-called quantitative tightening, the opposite of QT, uh, opposite of QE. And they're still doing it, even though interest rates are kind of stable, but Federal Reserve is still doing the QT. So Federal Reserve is still tightening, no question about it. But if they tighten too much and the real estate prices, for example, start falling very sharply, then we're going to have balance sheet recession all over. So they, they have to do this in a very delicate fashion, very carefully in small steps to make sure that things do not really go over the cliff. That's where the Federal Reserve is right now. And this is a problem all central banks uh, that did quantitative easing will have to face going forward. And I'm so glad that Taiwan does not have this problem because Taiwanese central bank was smarter than the rest of the guys, <laughs> did not do QE. And so this problem will not arise here, but it's going to happen in Europe, in UK, in Japan, uh, as well as, of course, the United States. So <clears throat> we, when we are looking at financial markets, we have to remember that this is the first time in history the central bank is tightening monetary policy with excess reserves in the banking system. And that is causing all sorts of problems here and there that we never had to even think about in, in the earlier world where excess reserves are always limited. So from here, let me move to the next topic. Is China following the Japanese path? And ever since Chinese bubble, housing bubble burst, I've been getting tons of calls from Chinese uh, journalists, economists, investors, sometimes policymakers asking me, are we going the way of Japan? Are we going the way of Japan? And some of you might have noticed that last week I did one event and that thing went viral in China. 600,000 downloads in like two days about the topic that I'm going to share with you right now because you know, it's not fair that the people in China knows what I'm talking about and people here doesn't know what I'm talking about. So I'll try to explain uh, how I view this Chinese situation relative to what Japan went through uh, 30 years ago. This is what happened to Japanese bubble. This is the Japan's commercial real estate prices. In the Japanese case, it's the commercial real estate that led the bubble, and the housing was, was kind of secondary. And it went from you know, 20 here to 100 in just five years. So Japanese commercial real estate prices went up five times in five years. So you can imagine how horrendous the bubble was. At the top of the bubble, they said the Imperial Palace Gardens in the middle of Tokyo was worth the entire state of California. That was the most ridiculous period uh, that Japan was going through. But at that time, uh, people felt rich, spent a lot of money, so GDP was going up very sharply as well, both in nominal and real terms. And then the bubble burst, and it came crashing down, fell to the level of 1973, 87% down nationwide, not just little corner of Tokyo, the entire country. So just imagine in ta Taiwan, Taipei prices down 87, 
新北市 down eighty seven， 鹿港 down eighty seven， 台中 down eighty seven， 高雄 down eighty seven， 屏东 down eighty seven。What kind of economy you think you got left in Taiwan? Then you look at the Japanese. Sorry, sorry.、Hmm? Look at the Japanese GDP. It never fell below the peak of the bubble, even though asset prices fell eighty seven percent nationwide. That's the most remarkable part of the Japanese experience, in my view.、Uh, but it did have an impact on individual companies, and this is what happened to the corporate sector of Japan. Let me explain how this chart is put together. There's a horizontal line going across at zero. If the blue bars here goes further up, that means they're increasing their financial assets, bank accounts, bonds, whatever. If the orange bars goes further down, that means they are increasing their borrowings, issuing more bonds or borrowing more money from the bank, and the net number is this line with the small circles. This shows whether the corporate sector as a group is a net borrower or net saver. And if you look at the 80s, it's below zero, between five and ten percent, minus five to minus ten percent. That means corporate sector was busily borrowing money from the household sector and investing in all sorts of assets. And during this time, of course, Japan was you know at the top of the world, beating everybody. Then once the bubble burst, you see that suddenly this orange line starts shrinking very rapidly. By 1997, the orange bars above zero. Orange bars above zero means they are actually paying down debt at zero interest rates. By then, Japan has zero interest rates. And by 1999. The whole line is above zero, so the entire corporate sector is paying down debt, and this is still with zero interest rates. And that go, goes on for like 20 years. No one told us that companies are supposed to pay down debt at zero interest rates, right? They should be borrowing money, but they are all busily repairing balance sheets. What that means is that during this period, Japanese companies could not use all their cash flow. For new product development, more marketing efforts, more export markets, they had to use their cash flow to pay down debt, and that's why Japanese economy began to slow down. The momentum that Japanese companies had before were lost because so many companies had to use the cash flow to repair their balance sheets instead of developing new products,、uh, fighting in the new markets, and of course that's where Taiwanese companies, South Korean companies came in. To take take over the Japanese market, so it did have an impact in slowing down Japan. One company, of course, was not affected by this,、uh, and that's Toyota. Toyota came out with a super sophisticated technology called hybrid technology, and became the top auto companies、uh, very quickly. How did Toyota do that? And all the other ones, Nissan, Honda, start losing their the lead. Very simple. Toyota had no debt. Toyota was screwed by the bankers 70 years ago, and the family said this company will never borrow money. Period. So none of this was affecting Toyota. So Toyota could use all their cash flow to develop hybrid technology, other technologies, and Toyota continued to do very well. But Nissan and others had to、uh, fight with these balance sheet problems, so th that's why they fell behind. Well, most recently, the orange bars are below zero, so they are no longer paying down debt, which is good. But the net number is still above zero. Why? The ba balance sheet is already clean. How come they are still not borrowing? Well, as I said earlier, there's a trauma toward debt. They don't want to borrow money. And the second reason is that it's more profitable to borrow outside the country and invest outside. So that's why it's、uh, in this shape. But for Japan to really become a normal, strong economy, this one has to come down. That's when Japanese economy is really back to the、uh, textbook world. So that's what happened to the companies. So how did Japan manage to keep its GDP from falling? Well, government borrowed the money. And if government borrows the money, then the economy can the money comes back to the income stream. Economy can move forward. So this chart shows who borrowed the money and who saved the money in Japan. There's a horizontal line going across zero. Above zero are the people saving money. Below zero are the people borrowing money. 
And there are four lines here, household line, corporate line, government line, and the rest of the world line. If you add the four lines together, you're supposed to get zero. That's how these things are put together. And as you can see, it is the corporate sector that screwed, <laughs> screwed up Japan in that during the bubble days, they borrow lots of money, this one. And then once the bubble burst, they realized that, oh my gosh, we have to repair our balance sheets. Then became the huge savers. Uh, corporate se sector was actually a bigger saver than the household sector during this period because the, the problem was just so large. But the government sector, the green line, went the opposite direction. And this is the, the part that kept the Japanese economy going. So the point is, if you're in this type of recession, you have to have a government borrowing and spending money. No other policy will work, whether it's a structural policy, monetary easing, none of those work because the problem is with balance sheets. Government has to come in and borrow. Now then you look at this with the Chinese uh, data. This shows what happened to house prices in Beijing compared to what happened to house prices in uh, Osaka and Tokyo area exactly 30 years earlier. And the magnitude of the bubble looks like it's about the same. And of course, recent numbers that is coming out of China, no one can trust anyway. <laughs> but so uh, the fact that a lot of people are saying house prices are falling, uh, real estate prices are falling, suggests to me that China is already in a balance sheet recession. Because when that happens, and of course, we all hear that Chinese people are not borrowing money. They're actually paying down debt. So that also suggests that China is already in a balance sheet recession. But there is one huge difference between Japan and United, uh, China. 30 years ago, when Japan was falling into the balance sheet recession, nobody had any idea what kind of recession we were faced with, including myself. Because we were never taught in universities this whole concept of balance sheet recession. So the Japanese government tried this policy, that policy, see what, which one will work. None of them seems to work very well because we had no idea what disease is until I came up with the concept of balance sheet recession around 1997. But by then already, you know, asset prices have already collapsed. Today, Chinese are fully aware of this disease called balance sheet recession. As I was already mentioned earlier, I was told by a Chinese professor that nearly half of the PhD dissertations on economics written by Chinese students today are based on balance sheet recession. And I said to myself, I haven't got my PhD. How come these guys all are getting PhD based on my ideas? <laughs> Only Taishun is giving me PhD because he always calls me doctor. I don't have a doctor degree, by the way. <laughs> Uh, so this kind of article appears in Chinese newspapers. Uh, Ren Zhenfei and Gu Zhaoming. Why the two, you know, I have nothing to do with Mr. Ren Zhenfei, by the way. Uh, but the fact that this kind of article is showing up in a Chinese newspaper suggests to me that a lot of Chinese, Chinese people are already aware of this disease called balance sheet recession and how to cure it. And so China is falling into balance sheet recession, but my guess is that they're going to put in all the right policies in place and keep that in place long enough until this problem is over. So my guess is that it, as far as balance sheet recession is concerned, China is in a very good position because they know exactly what to do. And I hate to say this, but in fighting balance sheet recession, Authoritarian government usually does a better job than democracies. <laughs> because in a democracy, if one side is for fiscal stimulus, the other side is always against fiscal stimulus, right? And they fight and fight and fight, and while all the time, economy is going down the drain. But if Mr. Mr. Xi Jinping gets the right advice, he can say, okay, do fiscal stimulus. In 20 minutes, this problem's over. And if the banking is a problem, and if he gets the right advice, put some capital into the banking system, and if Mr. Xi Jinping orders that, that's the end of the issue. Whereas in the United States or Japan, you know, you could go on fighting and fighting, fighting for hours, days, weeks, months, and then the economy keeps on going down and down and down. So because China is an authoritarian state, if he gets the right advice, they can handle these problems relatively quickly. I'm not saying it's good or bad, uh, but as far as this kind of recessions are concerned, 
they can often handle it better. Well, then is the China truly out of the problem? Not quite. And this is where the real problem is. If you look at the Chinese flow of funds data, which is exactly the same data as the Japanese one, you notice that the Chinese companies actually stopped borrowing money five years before the bubble burst, starting from two, here, 2016, and then start reducing their borrowings. And because the household sector is still saving money, and the companies stop borrowing money, the government had to come in to save the uh, Chinese economy. So this green line is the government. This is all happening before the bubble, uh, before the bubble burst. And this is very, very disturbing. Why? Because China is at the, that stage of economic development where the companies should be busy borrowing money and expanding their production systems. I mean, we know Chinese are very entrepreneurial. They have lots of technology. They are coming up with lots of innovative uh, products, very interesting products. And they are still very competitive even with the higher wages that they have to pay because you can see from their export numbers, right? Still very, very competitive economy. And so if you're a Chinese entrepreneur with a factory to produce these uh, newer products, they should be borrowing money and investing, expanding. And then you see that that's not happening. They're actually not borrowing money. I wonder why that is the case. Is it because of these uh, conflict with the, with the United States and Western markets may not be open? I don't know what are the reasons uh, they stopped borrowing money, but that forced Chinese government to actually borrow a lot to keep the Chinese economy going. So even before the bubble burst, starting from 2016, Chinese economy was actually supported by fiscal stimulus of the Chinese government, mostly, mostly regional governments. But what that means is that by now, regional, as, as all of you are aware, Chinese regional governments are in very sad shape. They basically you know, exhausted their borrowing capacity. People are very uh, afraid of lending money to regional governments now. But from this point, they have to fight balance sheet recession, so this number has to go much further because this number is likely to go this way. And that's going to be a huge uh, challenge for the Chinese economy and for the fiscal authority. My guess is that regional governments probably won't be able to handle it. So the central government has to come in and either help the region, uh, regional governments or do the fiscal stimulus by themselves. Because the regional governments on their own probably cannot do any more fiscal stimulus given uh, how much debt they already are carrying. And so that's going to be a big challenge on the fiscal side. And furthermore, when Japanese bubble burst, the construction was about 20% of Japan's GDP. And it was already on a declining trend. So in, when Japanese bubble burst, it, oh, sorry, the Japanese bubble was the prices went high and came crashing down. Not much impact on the construction. But in the Chinese case, there was a huge construction boom. And now the construction industry is frozen. But that's 26% of China's GDP. If construction is reduced by even by 10%, China will lose 2.6% uh, of its GDP. So in addition to balance sheet recession driven by balance sheet problems, they have this construction recession that they have to address with more fiscal stimulus as well. And of course, this decoupling or de-risking, the West composed of about 55% <clears throat> of global GDP, and they are, the uh, per capita GDP of the West on average is $60,000. So all the rich customers are there if decoupling means you are losing access to this market and you're only left with that one, the non-West is about 27% uh, of global GDP, but the per capita GDP is only 14,000. So you, you lose your best customers, the richest customers, and you're stuck with the poor ones. Maybe that's why Chinese companies don't want to invest. Because if you invest the factories, invest the production, and then you suddenly you, have, you lose your market 
in those uh, economies, then you'll be stuck with this overcapacity. And finally, the population. As most of you are aware, uh, Chinese population start declining uh, this year or last year. And many of you have heard this argument that, oh, Japan is doing so poorly because demographics are so bad. The population is shrinking. That argument, in my view, is nonsense. Because Japanese population peaked in 2009. Japanese bubble burst 1990. So there was a 19 years where Japanese population was growing. So you cannot explain the Japanese deflation during that 19 years because Jap Japanese population was still growing. It's only after 2009 that Japanese population starts shrinking. But in the Chinese case, the bursting of the bubble and the population shrinking happening on the same year. So this is going to be quite a bit of challenge for the Chinese policymakers. Because even though po population itself doesn't affect the economy all that drastically right away, people's mind for investments will be affected. When people start thinking that, wow, population is shrinking, the markets will be shrinking, then let's put the production somewhere else instead of at home. You know, people start thinking like that. And so even though population doesn't affect the economy right away, it could still affect the uh, investment side of it, and that could affect the economy eventually. So let me skip that part. So if I compare what Japan faced back in 1990 and China this, uh, this time, Japan had a bursting of the bubble and the balance sheet recession. That was bad enough. And then you, at the time, Japan and the U.S. had quite a bit of trade friction. It was very ugly trade friction. I was involved in it myself on the American side. Uh, but that was just with, within the businesses. The Japanese markets were largely closed at that time. Americans wanted to sell more semiconductors and other things to the Japanese market. And Japanese said, no, 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 we don't want it. It's the opposite of the Chinese uh, issue. Americans are saying, no, you cannot buy our semiconductor. And back then, Americans are saying, Japanese, you buy our semiconductor. Well, <clears throat> that was the trade friction back then. But basically, just those two, because population was still growing and so forth. The Chinese are facing this many problems. Uh, bursting of the uh, surprise bubble and the balance sheet recession, that is one area where Chinese, China can handle it quite easily because they already know the disease, they all know, know how to handle it. But then there's a construction recession in addition to it. And then, of course, Chinese companies are not borrowing money, so government was already running large deficits before that. Not the central government, but the regional governments. And that has depleted the regional government's borrowing capacity quite a bit. And then, of course, this geopolitical problem with the West this may be the one that's affecting all the other ones. And then middle income trap. China is in, in the middle of middle income trap in that when you're the lowest cost producer, all the factories from around the world will come to you. But once your cost becomes much higher, all these factories will then start moving away, away from you to Vietnam, Indonesia, and places like that. And it's not just the foreign companies. Chinese companies may move that too. Looks like a lot of Chinese policymakers have forgotten that they are in the middle income trap because whenever Americans come up with some sort of a sanctions against China, Chinese immediately come up with their own sanctions, right? And they keep on adding sanctions to each other. But it's China that's in the middle income trap. And if you do all these sanctions, more, less and less people will invest in China. Whereas, you know, U.S. is not affected because U.S. is already out of the middle income trap. But somehow, no one is telling Mr. Xi Jinping that, look, we are in the middle income trap. We shouldn't do these sanctions so easily. But anyway, <clears throat> and then these regulatory uncertainties on so many areas, um, tech industry, financial industry, real estate industry, education sectors, suddenly government comes up with these regulations and all your investments are worth nothing next day. If you do a few of these, of course, businessmen will become very, very cautious. If you have five ideas, maybe you do only two. The three never shows up because only in the heads of, the, of the, these businessmen, but it will affect the economic growth going forward. And of course, population, 
And finally, and this one I have no evidence to prove it myself, but during the COVID-19, a lot of governments provided a lot of help, financial help to the households and companies, at least in the developed world. In China, I hear that they didn't do very much of that, which means most, business, most businesses, many households, had to weather the COVID-19 lockdowns by themselves. If that's the case, they must have depleted their savings during the period. And now that the economy is back, people can work. If all these Chinese house, households and companies decided that, wow, now we, ha we have to rebuild our savings. And if they all start rebuilding their savings to the level they had before, that's another balance sheet recession, but on, on the asset side. Now, the earlier balance sheet recession I talked about is on the liability side. The liability is too big, so they have to compress it. Now, on this one, the, the savings are too low. They want to rebuild it, so it's on the asset side. But the net effect on the economy will be the same, that everybody's saving money is no one borrowing money. I don't know how much of that is actually happening, but if, as we hear, that people are paying down debt, trying to save money, is coming from that reason, then that's another challenge for the Chinese policymakers. So you put all these things together. I must say that even though China has certain advantages over the Japanese back 30 years ago, taken together, I would say, the challenge Chinese policymakers facing is far bigger than the challenge Japanese faced 30 years ago, which means China is going to, Chinese economy is likely to slow down uh, even under the best of circumstances. And if they screw up any of these, it could slow down even more. So we're going to be facing the second largest economy in the world, our largest trading partner slowing down going forward, and we should be prepared for this, this kind of situation going forward. Thank you very much.